Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for Webinar Wednesday. Um, today we have a DEI um, fundamentals, sort of a little intro, and this is presented by S.J. Simpson Joseph Esquire, aka Jay. And uh, we got to be working with Jay because Jay worked with our um, Accelerates president, Steve Heckler, for a nonprofit company that he works for in Atlanta. And they needed a little help with some team building and just some um, working some magic. So Jay came in and um, really impressed the heck out of everybody, including Steve. And so when we learned that she also taught DEI, we were just kind of like, we must have her. So now we, uh, we have her classes and she's a wonderful instructor and we're going to get started here just in a moment. Just wanted to let you know that this session is being recorded and it will be up on our YouTube channel. It will also be up on accelerate.com slash library slash videos and we'll be sending you a copy of the presentation in an email after this is over. And just to tell you a little bit about Accelerate, my name's Anne. I've been with Accelerate for 12 years now, um, but we've been in business for almost 20 years and we teach a variety of different technologies all over the US worldwide and of course online. Um, so other things that we teach other than the DEI courses, um, we teach programming classes, data science, um, uh, Microsoft products, robotics process automation, AWS, DevOps, JavaScript libraries, and a lot more. Um, but today, of course, we're here to talk about DEI. And um, if you go to our website, accelerate.com slash DEI dash training, you'll see four courses there. Um, so Jay actually literally wrote all of the courses. And if you get her on the phone, she will be really good at customizing any class that you should need. Um, we teach online or sometimes in person. Um, and uh, Many of the courses are one or two days, but Jay is so wonderful and flexible that she can do half days. Um, sometimes people want, you know, every Tuesday we want a two hour seminar. Um, so she can work with you to do that. Um, so Jay is an attorney, um, graduate of Stanford Law School. She's a strategic coach with 20 years experience in transformation management and with a specialization in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And she was, congratulations, recently named DEI Leader of the Year for 2021 by the Global Association of Talent Development's Greater Atlanta Chapter. So awesome. Um, and she serves, as an, <laughs> she serves as an advisor to corporations, federal, state governments, nonprofits. Um, and she can really go in and she uses her, her methodology of critical thinking, creative um, solutions. And she's really able to get in there um, see what the organization needs and is able to trans transform them. And so when Steve saw what she did with their nonprofit, um, he was he was so impressed. And that's why. And this is this is why we get Jay. And I've also seen her in action. And um, she does work some magic. So we, we thank you so much for being here, Jay. And I want to say welcome to everyone. So one of the things about the voice in your head is that oftentimes we think we're the only person that has that voice going on in our head. And and some of the ways that the video highlights a voice in your head is that thing of where, let's say you're somebody that um, that has done a hard day's work and um, and you know that you have to leave and go and pick up your your kids at the end of the day. Now it may be that you know you you we typically think of that as a mom, but it may be, for example, you know um, a dad who's at work and having that experience. As you put your bag over your shoulder and you're walking out the door and you see people kind of look a little side-eyed at you, the question is, what's that voice in your head that goes off saying, oh, wow, do they think I'm committed or uncommitted to my work? And so what, that, what I want to emphasize and invite you all to do today is just to think about what is that little voice in your head that can show up sometimes when you're in a work environment, whoever you are, that little voice of doubt um, that shows up. And so I want you to think about that because that's part of what this explores. It's the idea that when we hear a little voice in our head, we're not the only one hearing it. Um, and what do we do and how do we enable ourselves to be empowered around, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say the synonym for that voice in our head can be doubt or wondering or concern around how we are landing with other individuals in our workspace. So that said, um, I invite you to think about that little voice, um, but also to think and just to recognize that we're all humans and we all have that little voice. So one of the things I want to do, I was going to share with you um, 
my little voice um, before I start talking about the intentions of this workshop. So I have a little bead here in my hair. I always wear beads in my hair. And my little voice says, well, I wonder if the participants noticed that, that little bead. And if they did, what, if they made it mean something about me, something positive or negative, something, um, something that says something about you know who I am as a woman in this society, a woman of color, um, whether it made them think about something about my hair or not. And in fact, now that I'm saying these things, now you may be thinking, hmm. But my point is, we all have these little voices going on in our head, and sometimes they can also be synonymous with what shows up as um, as little bias biases that we don't realize we have or that we do realize that we have. So one of the things I want to go ahead and dive into is what are the intentions of this workshop? So I have the slide on the screen. I'm not gonna um, bore you all by reading it through bullet by bullet, but I want us to go ahead and take a look at it. And what I want to acknowledge is the fact that really the foundation and framework for exploring diversity, equity, and inclusion is really in fact understanding what are the core concepts of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the first place. What are they and how can we as a collective um, group of team members when you're in a given company, corporate environment, have what I like to call with my lawyer hat on a meeting of the minds. And what that means is oftentimes we think we have a sense of what our definition is of diversity or equity and inclusion, but it may in fact be different from the person who, um, who works beside us. And sometimes some of the very challenges that arise come up because we don't all have the same sense of what diversity and equity and inclusion actually really, um, really mean, how we're defining them collectively. So that meeting of the minds is an opportunity for a collective understanding of and defining of what diversity, equity, and inclusion is. And inside of that then is it with that understanding, mutual understanding enables us to then function in a fashion that allows for more um, collaborative work and increases the ability for us to, to be more productive and more inclusive in our work. So again, what we're gonna do is to really understand these core concepts of DEI to define the benefits of a diversity, equity, and inclusion initiative within an organization. Um, to, take a, to take a significant step in embracing the vision for um, an understanding of what DEI really is. Now, I know we only have, um, <laughs> I'm checking my time here, 50 minutes and counting. So clearly what I'm offering is just kind of like a, a taste or a flavor for understanding these things. But what I really want to emphasize is that these intentions really symbolize the approach and the strategic methodology that we can take toward beginning to transform an organization inside of our diversity, equity, and inclusion work. I do also want to acknowledge, and I, I'm, I'm, I see from some of the attendees, that there are many of you that are already actively involved in diversity, equity, and inclusion work. In already, um, you know, you may have a strong expertise in it, or you may be in a space of saying, I have literally no idea what diversity, equity, and inclusion really means in practice, or perhaps even in defining. Um, one of the things I want to emphasize is that wherever you are, that's the place to come to this workshop. That's the place to come to this webinar. It's one of the important components of recognizing that diversity, equity, and inclusion are truly um, values that are often quite, um, quite challenging to grasp, to understand. I think for some people, they may be optimistic and hopeful when you begin a DEI dialogue and set of practices within an organization. Um, they may be also resistant or frankly, um, you know, downright saying, you know what, we don't need this. What does this even mean? So one of the things I like to emphasize when I do a diversity, equity, inclusion workshop is that all you are welcome in whatever space you're in. So I invite you right now, as I continue to move forward, to think about where are you at in regard to diversity, equity, inclusion, and to recognize that inside of this space, there's room for all of us um, because we're all gonna be dialoguing, learning, and growing together. Um, so why does DEI matter? You know, one of the things that's really pivotal is sometimes we, you know, people think about DEI from the perspective of, um, Hmm. Well, it's important. I want my, you know, I want my kids to understand that it's, you know, nice to be, you know, not to be a jerk to your classmates or, you know, to to really respect everybody. Um, but maybe that's where it stops. So, fortunately, um, that's not the case. And fortunately, diversity, equity, and inclusion are practices that have 
really, really um, become far more um, pivotal and critical inside of where we are right now in 2022. Started to say 2021. I don't know if anybody else's mind worked that way, but um, so we've taken a lot of progress and ground in corporations, in federal and state government, in nonprofits, and in um, and in individual environments, in recognizing that there really is value to um, the practices of DEI. And I promise we're going to define those further in a moment. But first, I want to talk about what are the benefits for DEI, and I want to specifically emphasize it in this case as it pertains to your company and your organization. Um, so some of these are obvious, and you know, again, as I said, I may be also singing with the choir in some cases in regard to the fact that you may already, um, you know, be knee deep in a DEI initiative in your own organization. But sometimes we um, really don't focus upon recognizing just how many tangible benefits there are, literally what the ROI is in regard to making sure that DEI is embedded throughout your company. So therefore, we've got um, the DEI benefits of for your company being all about building inspired teams, providing better and more productive communication, uh, strengthening employment recruitment, employee recruitment and retention, improving productivity, and of course, increasing profitability, um, and then really developing faster and more effective problem solving. And lastly, but very important, advancing customer loyalty and impacting social good. Those are all really pivotal aspects of it. So for DEI fundamentals, which I promise will be really our core focus for this particular webinar, um, I like to talk about the fact that we've got what we call DEI heart strides and the DEI foundation or framework. So right now, inside of DEI heart strides, that's a recognition that the process of transformation really lies in both um, heart and mind inside of our DEI social justice work when we're exploring it. So what that means is, when I think about um, you know, working for many years in this field, I think about the fact that there was a time when you're in a um, environment inside of an organization, corporation, in a boardroom, we're utilizing terms such as, you know, dare I say, love. Ah. Um, would have, have you looked at askance? Now, I'm not saying that you can just kind of walk in your you know, boardroom saying, I just love everyone, although you know that <laughs> it's a tempting thing to do. Try it out sometime. Um, but really, well, no, with my labor hat on, that's another conversation. But really what I'm saying is that even when I read, you know, extraordinary um, articles um, and white papers by CEOs of current corporations, whether it's, um, whether it's Verizon or Twitter, um, there's a recognition that both mind and heart matter when it comes to the work of diversity, equity, and inclusion. One of the things that I've worked to develop is a methodology so that it's not just um, conversation, but actually practices around how can we incorporate DEI, what I like to call heart strides, inside of how we do our work. And then recognizing also that with a DEI, the very foundation of our work provides a core understanding of how can we actually translate these values into practice. So one of the things that, that I want to talk about in regard to um, diversity is recognizing that diversity is what makes each of us different. So for me, in terms of this particular webinar, if I can convey one thing perhaps more profoundly than any other, it's to really encourage that we take an expansive view on the question of what is diversity. So now for me, as a woman of color talking with you, my diversity, if you will, is obvious and apparent. Um, and I take great, great joy and pride in being who I am. But I also take great joy and pride in recognizing that we are all humans and that it is the collective group of us as humans that that's what diversity is. So literally what that means is that really diversity is about each and every one of us being different, therefore human, and therefore um, working to really disappear this concept of other, this concept where I'm diverse, but you're not. So what I wanna emphasize is the fact, and I just invite you all to really study this diversity definition and recognize that it talks about that diversity can be more or less apparent, and that it includes everything from age and ethnicity, um, parental status, nationality, sexual orientation, skin color, but also literally the perspectives of thought. 
of life experience, of lived experience, of whether you, you know, whether you grew up, um, I'm using some real basic terms here, poor or rich, but how do you define that and how do you hold it? It's your story and your voice and how you define it. And why does that matter? It matters because the more we can embrace a recognition that diversity actually is each and every one of us being different, the more we can embrace a recognition that, well, so then all of our voices matter all of our voices um, make a difference in terms of how we can actually um, speak to one another and help one another to really understand the nature of diversity and the nature of the fact that diversity matters in that when we're all inside of one room and we're all comfortable in our ability to share who we are and what our journey is, it actually enhances the experience and can enhance the environment as well. So while um, while this is a webinar, so I'm just giving you a little taste and flavor for what for what the actual workshops and trainings would be like. Um, here, what we really would do, so I'm going to invite you to do it on your own as well, would be to, we do a diversity exercise, and that in this case would just be please I invite you in your own time to think about your life journey, but through this prism of this diversity definition. So to think about defining how your journey has gone. For me, for example, I grew up in Jamaica, Queens, New York. Um, I, mean, I don't know, I can't, unfortunately, I don't get to hear the shout outs or not um, in regard to it, but I grew up in Jamaica, Queens, New York. I am the child of, um, of parents who, my dad was a social worker in the South Bronx. Um, he spent his entire life committed to uh, the work of change and transformation um, for, you know, for extremely disenfranchised um, and also quite amazing um, community. My mom, um, who is, I believe, on this um, on this webinar right now, was a um, and always will be an educator in the inner city um, in Queens, New York. Um, and she did everything from teaching kindergarten to running a middle school, um, where she uh, did extraordinary work there. So my point in this case, though, in addition to sharing something about myself, is also just to recognize that. I grew up where our dinner table conversation, when we could slow down long enough to join around the table, um, at you know what one moment, um, was around the work of social good. So you know that's my wiring. But I also describe it to say you know that's my diversity story. That's my my journey, if you will. And so I invite you to think about your journey from the standpoint of how then do you show up in the world and what is your your prism or perspective. I remember doing um, doing this diversity exercise with some team members, who um, one of whom was this you know extraordinary teacher, um, a white woman, um, probably I think she maybe it's about 65, and she had single single handedly raised four kids in addition to all the extraordinary children that she is now working with at this school. The reason I share about her though was because when we started the exercise, her approach was I'm so honored to work with these diverse young people because the young people were um, from a school, for, a school for refugee girls. But through the exercise and the exploration, what she began to own was her own diversity journey. So some of the things that I just told you about. So for example, if you're a single parent, that's part of your diversity story. That's different from someone who's, um, who's in a nuclear family, if you will. And then of course, the definition of nuclear family um, is one that's always organic and varying as well. How one person holds that is different from another. I emphasize all these examples because really what I want to convey is just that we are each different. And inside of recognizing this sense of our diversity and owning it, then it enables us to not see someone as other and disconnected, but to see them as human and part of our collective community environment. Obviously the benefits to that are quite apparent when you think about your team in a work environment, because once you approach things that way, you're far more, um, both I think honest and vulnerable with yourself, but you're also able to then be open um, with your teammates in terms of being receptive to what their journey is, to differences of thought and opinion as well. Um, and so this is just, again, encouraging that diversity journey. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead, I wanna talk about equity, but I wanna start by talking about it in picture form because of course a picture really is worth a thousand words. And I promise that when I am doing um, my workshops and trainings, there are a lot more um, uh, different um, innovative tools that I use, um, but I really wanted to be able to convey the information today. Um, but it's very much what I like to call a, a, a more than five senses experience. Um, 
So I want to talk about equity in picture form and just invite you to look at the distinction between these two pictures. Now, of course, there's equality, which we can all value greatly, both as a, as a term, as well as a practice, as well as a right. But by the same token, what equality here highlights is the fact that we are in a place where we have three equal boxes. Everybody got the same box, but look what it provides and more importantly, what it does not provide. Similarly, when you move over to equity, when we talk about fairness in every situation, then you look at the fact that through just taking a moment, because if you think about it, it didn't probably really take that long to vary the, um, the organization of these boxes such that each person is now able to see the game. And that's the beauty in it. Each person is able to have that experience and to receive what they needed in order to do it. Um, and I think I want to emphasize the fact that sometimes people get a little put off when they hear that term equity, as if it implies that someone's going to be given something that, that they're not deserving of, or that somehow takes something away from you when somebody else is given what some people might define as you know, a leg up. However, if you see this picture, is it really a leg up? No, it's simply making sure that there's a level field, if you will, so that everybody can see over that fence and thus be fully participatory. I'm gonna go ahead to one more slide. I adore this because again, look at the distinction here. You know, so important access is pivotal because here we look at the distinction between equality and equity and think about the fact that, um, you know, when you looked at that first picture, you may or may not have thought about, well, but what if I'm in a wheelchair? What if I'm differently abled? How is it that I then get to view? You know, and that's so pivotal. And so here with equity, you see that an additional accommodation has been made so that everyone can see. So you can again ask yourself, well, you know, what would it take? What's the cost, for example? Let's say, what's the cost um, of building out this ramp? Well, you can look at it and say, well, you know, that would increase our budget by X, but you can also look at it as the value that it can that it provides is extraordinary. And let's say, and I don't just mean I don't just mean the social good value. I do also mean the productivity value. Because if you stick with that equality picture and the person in that wheelchair doesn't get to see the game, doesn't get to participate, you lose out on everything that that person had to give. And if you map it into an employment circumstance, in that circumstance, eventually, what may happen is that you know, lack of retention, that person goes away and you miss out on some of the most extraordinary contribution to your corporation that you could have experienced. So I'll take us back for a moment to the equity definition, and I'll invite you to take a look at that. Um, but you know, really, again, equity is that approach that ensures simply that everyone has the same opportunities. It's a very, very pivotal um, value, and it's pivotal to incorporate it in practice. And a lot of what I do in the trainings is work with teams to define ways that equity can be put into practice in real time as well. And so then I will move on to inclusion. And this is the whole exploration around a safe space. And so again, um, one of the things I want to talk about is that going back to that DEI heart strides, that mind and heart proposition, one of the things that I do is I do a whole workshop around DEI heart strides because the thing is it truly is transformative. Because if you think about your life, if you understand something from an intellectual perspective, that's one thing that's you know utilizing a particular wiring of your body. But when you start to incorporate, um, incorporate the heart, incorporate other senses into how you're processing a circumstance, a given situation, it really can in fact make a tremendous difference because then you've embraced it um, wholeheartedly as opposed to having a more distant relationship um, to a given proposition. So in this case, I'm gonna mix it up a little. Um, I don't recall quite well, yes, and did say that, um, that I apply creative solutions. What I do is I define myself actually as a um, creative, uh, creative advocate or even more so a poetic activist. Um, for me, sometimes the most uh, pure form of being able to express ideas, uh, thoughts, concepts, to contribute to social change is through poetry. This poem is called Freedom Dance, and I invite you to reflect upon it uh, through the prism of inclusion. And I'll go ahead and share it with you now. Um, so you can kind of lean back, you don't have to read the words. I will share it with you. 
freedom dance. Hear the whisper of the sound, the rhythm of the beat. I can feel it in my soul, though dancing with bound feet. To execute a pirouette, I simply tilt my head, for arms that chain behind one's back cannot be used instead. My grace is not within my leap or twirls up off the floor. No, it shines from deep within my glance and how my spirit soars, how my spirit soars. So I invite you just to, to contemplate um, for yourself what that poem means in the context of inclusion, in the context of the distinction between being able to, um, to soar and to not feel bound versus feeling bound or silenced or not included in its most basic form. And I would love to have a more expansive dialogue with you all on that. And I invite you to, um, to, join, the, to join the trainings where that's exactly part of how we would explore it. So then I'm gonna go on and I'm, I'm, I promise I'm gonna save time at the end for some questions as well. But I just wanna talk about DEI uprising, literally recognizing that it can indeed be a framework within your organization. And obviously it doesn't take the place of all the other extraordinary work, uh, accomplishments, strategic planning that you have. But what it is is an opportunity to, to make sure that diversity, equity, equity and inclusion, that little tongue twister there, um, are thoroughly integrated in your organization. Also recognize that it's a process, it's a journey. Um, you know, it's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, over my shoulder, I've got my little uh, Marine Corps marathon um, medal. I won't tell you how long ago it was, but the point is that I can testify to the pain of um, being in the 19th mile and saying, oh my God, I've got to keep pushing. But I also love to use that as an example of um, the fact that when we face challenges, um, we can recognize that that we can push through them. Um, so I guess that's also a little bit more about, about my journey and recognizing the power of pushing ahead and moving forward and recognizing the power that sometimes you gotta pace yourself. So one of the things that I recognize is one, um, of course, sharing and just re literally recognizing and writing statements saying diversity, equity, and inclusion matter to us, matter to our organization, matter to our corporation. I think there's deep value in that. Um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion around the concept that is that simply performative when it's a statement and it stops there. Well, the whole point is that we really and truly want to thoroughly embed DEI and recognize that it is not just the values that we stand on, but also these systems and practices that we design, define, and integrate throughout a given entity that matter but it does start with actually recognizing that the value matters and having the, the commitment, the bravery and the courage to put it out there and to state that. Um, so with that, I love Brene Brown. And again, I wish I could um, see you all to see how many people going, yeah, Brene. Um, but she's an extraordinary, uh, she's really an extraordinary um, social scientist. Most importantly, she's an extraordinary writer, um, you know, leadership management expert worldwide. So I have included her quote here because one of the things that I find pivotal to, to accomplishing um, transformation or AKA change management within a given organization or just a given group of people, a group of humans is really the opportunity to approach the exercise as a team, to approach whatever you're doing as a team. And I am not saying that carving out a true um, team methodology and being true team in terms of your connectedness and relatedness is an easy task, um, but I think it's an extraordinarily worthwhile one. I'm sure there are many people um, also on this webinar who are team lead experts um, who are passionate about teams as well. I love the fact that um, inside of Brene's work and when I when I do work with teams, I highly encourage reading um, some of her, her more cutting edge books and also or pulling excerpts from them um, like exploring what is engaged feedback look versus feedback that keeps you at a distance, um, feedback that allows you to feel together. I'll be looking for that at the end too, and I appreciate it. Um, you know, looking at how can we be brave, how can we be vulnerable, how can we be candid and courageous? And so, uh, yeah, all those things of course matter, and we don't hit it every day, but the beauty of it is when you, as a collective group, agree that this is the these are the guiding principles under which we're going to function and of course everyone you know as a team explores what are the guiding principles for your team or your organization that work for you 
Um, but these principles also become the grounding and the seeding through which diversity, equity, and inclusion thrives within your organization. So for example, if you have the value of applying vulnerability, and I realize that's a loaded term sometimes, it's kind of like, well, what does that really mean? Is you know, we, I can do a whole workshop on that. But the point is that really, in this case, what I want to emphasize that vulnerability is also just about you know having the courage to be um, to be open and candid, um, and to um, and to expect and to offer that to your team and to those in your life. Okay, so creating a culture of empathy. These are just some of the core steps. I know, you know, we hear a lot of this language and, and of course the word empathy is one that um, that certainly is, is deep and meaningful to me. I think that the beauty of ah, not trying to romanticize where our society is, we've got some extraordinary challenges right now. That's another workshop, um, but we've got some extraordinary challenges right now from a political, social, economic, climate perspective. We do also have an ex have extraordinary opportunities. I choose to see it as the latter. I will say that um, Anne Frank is my great shero who chooses to see the the beauty and the power that lives inside of the world and in in a majority of the people who exist. So inside of that, I say one of the core best practices for allowing diversity, equity, and inclusion to flourish in a given organization once you've more actively actually explored what DEI really is work together to craft an actual definition, collective definitions that work for you, um, and begin also to build out team that are um, committed to these principles or who are committed to even exploring them. Again, as I said, wherever you're at, wherever, however you're feeling about DEI, you are a part of your given team and organization. And the idea is for mutual respect, but also mutual listening, learning, and openness to flourish. Um, let me be clear, there's a full recognition that, you know, that there are all sorts of, you know, um, bias, uh, microaggressions, macroaggressions, et cetera, that are rife within our environment, our culture, and all of our lives and organizations because we can't avoid that. Um, but the idea is how can we nonetheless work together to transform and continue to move forward to get to a point where even though those things exist, we're doing things such as cultivating allyship, meaning um, helping others to ex understand each of us better so that there's less other and less condemnation and more appreciation and mutual respect. Let me also be really clear when I say that when I come in and I do workshops, I am meeting people wherever they are. There are people who are devastated, hurt, and angry inside of a corporation who are silently working each day in pain. And this is an opportunity to be, when I say this, I mean this meaning this type of work. Sure, it's not for the faint of heart, because what it means is that people begin to actually be in, not only really be able to be in touch and be honored in touch with themselves and honored when they're having that experience, but then the real question becomes, then how do we start to transform that experience? Um, because people have value as team members in organizations. But what happens is oftentimes when someone's silently suffering, um, they end up leaving and we lose out on all the value that they had. Now, sometimes it's simply not a good, it's not a good fit or there's structural issues within a given um, org organizational infrastructure that are also delaying and inhibiting the opportunity for folks to really function and thrive, um, both as individuals in their responsibilities as well as a team. That's one of the other things that um, that we do a lot of work in inside of diversity, equity, and inclusion, because I don't look at it in a vacuum as just values to be laid laid before a team to say, okay, let's take these values on, let's have a meeting in the minds, and then let's rock. Basically, what the real question becomes also is you've got to study your organizational infrastructure, you've got to look at your systems and practices, and realize that sometimes it's those structures themselves that um, that make it difficult to practice DEI. An example of that might be, you know, if you've got a particular um, role, let's say an operations um, director, but inside of that, inside of that series of responsibilities that person holds, you've got several other um, roles rolled into one where they're really wearing five hats. The reality may then be that whatever that person's um, functioning commitment to wanting to even um, espouse or operate under some of the values of, let's say, inclusion, it may be the very work work um, organizational structure of their role and responsibility that's inhibiting the ability for them to perform and exercise inclusion. Um, so it's a, it's a really good example, something to take a look at 
from the standpoint of your organizational infrastructure designs to see where sometimes these things can show up. Um, so again, you know, I want to emphasize the fact that these are core steps that can be, you know, that can be um, applied to creating a culture of empathy. It's an ongoing process. And part of the important thing is always checking in with your team to really see, um, you know, to see if people are experiencing the culture as one of empathy, regardless of what everyone's commitment to that is. And again, there are policies and procedures and structures that go into, into making that process happen. So you can just, you know, it's not, of course there's questionnaires, surveys, et cetera. There are also, um, uh, workshops, dialogues, um, you know, even, you know, I would say even, for example, making sure that you have HR structures and so on, all of which interplay to allow you to emerge with a best practice organization where diversity, equity, and inclusion values flourish um, within the context of the work that you do. Um, so again, I want to talk about just where amplifying DEI, I happen to personally love that word, but I think it's a very um, pivotal one for when we dialogue about this, because it is a it is a slow amplification process where we're looking at how can we, um, you know, live this work out loud, so to speak. Um, so it's a paradigm shift that lives for DEI, and you can, you know, I hope that out of this webinar, you'll also really explore where you are at in regard to your company, your nonprofit, uh, your life, as it pertains to how DEI is um, is functioning, thriving, flourishing, or not in the context of your work. So just recognizing and emphasizing that really it's about, it's shifting your listening, it's shifting your seeing, your speaking, ultimately your actions, all of which working together begin to transform your community. And so I just want to emphasize also that the DEI journey is really, indeed, it is a catalyst for um, organizational uh, development and transformation and advancement um, and all the things that go into moving your organization forward. Um, again, as you can tell, this is something that I am extremely passionate about. For me, I am someone that literally went to law school so that I could understand more of what makes this country tick and if I perceive of you know the scales of justice like this and recognizing that in fact they're tilted like that um, so that so many are are disenfranchised or vulnerable or challenged and and my work is looking at how can I help to really have the scales of justice like so um, I'm sorry that you didn't get to see the the video around that little voice in your head but I'm assuming it's showing up right now as well because really when we pause and listen it always is um, so for me, though, one of the things that inspired me about that, about that, about that video is the fact that I think a lot about voice. Um, I use it from a poetic, uh, poetic activist perspective, as well as when I'm, um, when I'm writing and dialoguing about our voice being so pivotal. So you could, you could say it's a synonym, of course, for your, your contribution, your ideas, your work, who you are as an identity. Um, for me, I wrote a poem called Yesterday I Found My Voice, and I'd like to read it to you now um, and just share it as a context for what does it really mean to find your voice, to own your voice, and to share it, and to recognize that it can ebb and flow. We can have days where we feel that we're really, you know, in voice, um, you know, at the top of our game, if you will, and then days where it's not so much. Um, all of that makes us human beings, and so I'm going to go ahead and share this with you now. Yesterday, I found my voice. Today, I live to tell about it. I didn't shout from the rooftops. I didn't whisper or scream, but I spoke, and the words that I heard were my own. Yesterday, I found my voice. Today, I live to tell about it, and I sing a hallelujah chorus in a key I've never tried before. Tell about it. Tell about it. I am a warrior woman. I won't roll over or die, give up, dry up, or be sucked up. Yesterday, I found my voice, and it's here to stay because I can't let it go. I chant over and over, write on all my pages, say it again and again in my head, and then I open my mouth and I cry out loud, yesterday, I found my voice. Today, I'm here to shout about it. And this one's for you, all those who know exactly what I'm talking about. So thank you, I'm encouraging all of us to find and own our voice, but as important to support others in allowing their voices to, um, to come forth. Um, so I have saved time for questions. And then I know after that, 
Anne is going to um, share a little bit more about the course structure. So I'm going to go ahead and invite questions now. Um, and it looks like I'm already getting some. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to try to get to all of your questions. Um, but I will I'll just go ahead and dive in. So I've got one question that's asking about the concept of, um, let me see, what does it say exactly? It says, um, when you talk about a culture of empathy, how do you, sorry, I should have put my glasses on everyone. When you talk about a culture of empathy, how do you effectively launch one? What sense does that really make? I added that last part because I understood what they were um, asking. So when you talk about a culture of empathy, how do you really launch one? I think it's an excellent question because I really want to emphasize the fact that I fully understand that this work is both, um, you know, intellectual, um, you know, systemic uh, process and policy oriented. And it is also one that really, in fact, does require an engaging of an engaging of the heart, or if you will, an engaging of um, an emo emotional um, responses and emotional shifts, and recognizing that all these these different components go into the building of a culture of empathy, as the word empathy itself defines. Um, for me, I am a you know trained attorney, as was spoken of in the beginning. By the same token, I am, as I also said, a poet, so I kind of come by this wiring naturally, if you will. Um, but so in launching a culture of empathy, one of the things that's, that is pivotal is simply recognizing the fact that, um, A, that it actually is relevant, that it matters, so respecting that it's even relevant to a given space, and then B, it's actually working on um, allowing for in, an inclusive environment. So one where, one, you build practices and policies that respect um, and understand that people's diverse voices matter. That also means that if someone is, is being treated in a way that's not only unfair and inappropriate, but, you know, violating their, you know, their rights and so on, that there are systems in place in a given corporation um, to address that. So you have to have the systemic approach, but you also, you can also create a space where um, where you have practices in place so that, for example, when you enter a team meeting, a team meeting space, how do you make sure that you individually are respectful to the people inside of that discussion so that you're utilizing your own, I like to call it engaged feedback checklist. You're not speaking over someone. You're not, you can catch yourself and realize when you're making a, a biased judgment based on what somebody looks, based on that little, you know, uh, bead that's hanging out there that you get can get caught up in making assumptions about individuals as opposed to treating them treating the person and respecting them around that table. So those are just some components of it, but there are really core structures. And I do want to acknowledge that at this point, it truly creating a culture of empathy truly is considered part of the best practice journey toward making sure that you have a have a corporation where diversity, equity, and inclusion are really um, embedded throughout. And please notice I said like embedded and integrated throughout. It's not just like a quick add on or build on that you tack on on the side. And so I really want to um, to emphasize that as well. That's so important. Um, okay, so I see some other questions here. Um, so I've got a question in regard to, mm, I guess it's, it's sort of similar, but I'll, I'll go ahead and share it. Um, in regard to, so it's one thing, let's see, it's basically saying, how do you put these, how do you put diversity, equity, and inclusion into practice um, as an organization? So in other words, I guess what they're, I think what they're asking is, inside of diversity, equity, and inclusion, you can see it as a value, as a series of values, we've talked about that, but when it comes to actually putting it into practice, how does that work? Um, so one, I invite you, whoever wrote this, I totally invite you to please um, take that particular course. I have a whole course called you know, DEI, The Practitioner. But what I'll emphasize is a few things. One, you can't do it alone. So one of the most pivotal things is beginning to build out a, um, a team of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, can I call them like you know, champions, advocates, those who more actively believe in the, pro in the process or have come to a belief in it, um, so that they can become also um, kind of bridges to encouraging the people within the context of their subgroups and teams um, to have even more candid conversations. Because sometimes, regardless of what type of culture you build, these candid, honest conversations are, can be challenging to have. Um, and so creating that space is, is, a, is a very valuable one. I often recommend creating like a DEI, um, you know, a council, ad hoc committee, committee, subgroup, team, circle, and so on. Um, mo you know, most organizations that have, you know, evolved in their DEI work all have some form of model, as I've described. 
Um, and you know you can tailor it for your own organization. But a lot of how things get put into practice is via having a having a group that is um, focused intentionally upon exploring these ideas. However, it's and, and putting them into practice. But it is pivotal that this group not be doing that in isolation, um, or find themselves uh, you know just running with decisions, judgment calls, etc., and not bringing the organization along with them, which means that the way that you design your circle, your council, your committees is very pivotal to making sure that you are um, inclusive and not exclusive, even in the process itself, which is kind of um, ironic, but, you know, spot on as well. Um, I'm going to, I think I've only got time for one more question. Uh, let's see. So I've got one more question here that's asking me about um, whether or not um, whether or not I will be able to. Well, so actually, um, as I think Anne stated in the beginning, that yes, you will absolutely be receiving these. Um, you know, this as a recorded, uh, you know, webinar as well um, as a recording. But I am the person that wrote um, wrote the curriculum. I am honored to do these um, to do these trainings as well. I do have a small cadre of extraordinary DEI professionals who occasionally um, weave in and share their perspective in regard to different modules within the workshops that I do. Um, but I not only have written have written the entire curriculum, but I do also come and do the training myself as well. So. Um, I think I want to go ahead and pass it back to Anne so that we have time for her to share um, in regard to more about the course structure and uh, just to um, to wrap it up and bring us on home. Again, it has been an absolute honor and um, privilege to join you all and talk about something that um, that I think is extraordinarily important to us, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So thank you all. Hey, thank you so very much. Um, that was fabulous. And I think it's so cool that your mom uh, attended this webinar. <laughs> mm -hmm. Shout out. Right. Shout out to Jay's mom. Um, so, you know, unfortunately with the video, I don't think the audio is going to come through over GoToWebinar. Uh, yeah. However, since we will be, um, this session has been recorded, we will have the YouTube um, URL for, for this session that we'll be emailing to all the participants. Would it be okay to include the, um, the YouTube URL to your video in that as well? Oh, absolutely. That would be wonderful. And, and hopefully everybody right. experienced me sharing it as a little bit of a recreation of it. So, yeah. Okay, perfect. So everyone will be able to see it. I'm sorry, we just can't do it all together, but we'll have to all be together in spirit when you view it. Yes, um, yes. Let me just go ahead and... Okay, um, and hopefully you can just verify for me, Jay. Can you see my screen that has your classes up? Yes, I can. Okay, wonderful. So these are Jay's wonderful classes. And the, the first class that you see there, the diversity, equity, and inclusion demystified, which is sort of the fundamentals, that class is the class that maps to this webinar. So this webinar that Jay graciously gave us is sort of a little snapshot um, to this one. But of course, the only thing better than an hour with Jay is two days with Jay. Um, of course. <laughs> you can chop it up too, everybody. It's okay. <laughs> right, right. You don't, and, and it doesn't have to be two full, complete days. Jay's very uh, flexible. She can do, uh, you know, half days or seminars. And if you, I'm just going to scroll down here because for every class she has, you can see that she has an outline. Um, and this is really just a jumping off point. If you get Jay on the phone with you, she, she can go through, figure out what you all need, and then put together a perfect program for, for your team for exactly what you need. Um, so, uh, yeah, that one maps to this one. I don't know if you'd like to say anything about your, your other ones because I, I know they're really wonderful as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, you know, and I, I think actually during the webinar at times I referenced it, so I'll just kind of um, highlight. So then we have the, you know, DEI, um, the practitioner course, which is the next the next course. Um, and that basically, as I said, is really, you know, it, it's so often I talk I talk with um, different leaders and corporations who are saying, yeah, you know, we, we're embracing these values. We get it. We know it matters. But putting it systemically into practice feels like a whole other process. Well, um, you know, to some degree it is, although it's all integrated together. And so I really specialize in both. Um, I've done a, you know, a really expansive job of analyzing what are all the components and elements that are required in order to put it into practice. And then as I've said, I've worked with many, um, you know, teams, whether governmental, 
corporate nonprofit in that process itself. So this is the opportunity to join me as we work on, you know, work on that, explore it, and then I can support via the methodology and strategic approach that exists within the course um, to help you go ahead and launch your initiative um, secure and knowing that you have the best practices that are um, emerging as tried and true, and also to, you know, to really tailor it and intentionally make it your own. Um, and then Heart Strides, um, you know, which I, I you know, really loved talking about earlier as well. It's a very, it's a more unique course because it is very much focused on that, you know, that exploration around DEI heart strides. Again, that's that mind and heart approach to social justice and specifically to DEI. Um, and so that process, we really explore what are the, you know, the, the four pillars of the process. And again, not just, well, okay, that sounds fabulous and wonderful, but how does it get put into action? And that's very elusive um, concept to explore, but very powerful and impactful when one can actually indeed um, implement it. And that's what the course is all about. And then lastly, we have also looking at like the bridge to um, to global diversity. You know, I've had so many dialogues, of course, with you know corporations that are global in nature, or even more notably, looking to expand more globally and recognizing that you know cultural values, mores, etc., are different from country to country, city to city, um, et cetera. And so how do you then look at defining a culture um, of you know, building out global diversity and recognizing that DEI is relevant in that fashion as well, but what are the kind of what are the steps or the approach that one can take to even create a strategic action plan that thoroughly incorporates um, these values into your global approach to your work? And so that is also defined there as well. Oh, Thank you so much for that explanation. Oh, that's great, great. Um, all right, well, uh, we're, we're almost at the top of the hour. Um, so I just really wanted to thank you again, Jay, so much for this wonderful presentation and for everyone here for joining us. Um, before I end it, you'll you'll get a little um, pop-up for a little evaluation. And if you don't mind just taking a few minutes to fill it out, we really do read everything. We take it to heart. And this is also a great chance for you to say, what other webinar you might like. Um, so if you've got another topic, maybe somehow we could we could get Jay to come back sometime <laughs> and do something else or, you know, whatever, to, whatever. if you're looking for a class, uh, you can let us know and, um, you know, we can maybe set you up to talk with Jay. She's, like I said, she's really great at going in and finding out the heart of the matter and seeing what class would be perfect for you. So that would be a great opportunity to just, you know, let us know. Um, and any other feedback that you have would be great as well. And like I said, we'll be sending you an email with this presentation and with the, the video um, that, that we were not able to see it at the beginning, but we will in time. All right. So, um, well, thank you, everybody. And thank you, Jay. I'll go ahead and end this now. And um, we really appreciate everyone's time. So have a great rest of your day, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.